in a world where survival is the only rule and feelings have no place, where winning is everything and weakness is fatal. How much difference can one person make? That depends on the person. I made this. Hi, Steve Bly for Window Cleaning Magazine. We're here today at uh, Ed Array in beautiful Alameda, Northern California. And we're gonna go in and find out uh, just exactly what goes on behind these hallowed doors. Just just ignore the nose print on the glass for one. I... <laughs> <laughs> so over here, over here is their uh, kind of museum with their offshore powerboat trophies down at the bottom when they used to race race boats, uh, packaging expos. This um, hat was won on a bet between Jay Racing Steam Company and uh, Ettore, um, where uh, the, the founder came in and said that Ettore should be carried by Jay Racenstein and the, uh, they looked at it and said it doesn't seem that special to me. So he went around and seeded the market all around the shop and people started coming in and asking for the Ettore and uh, Racenstein bought Ettore the hat and it sits here in the magazine and the thing. And November 7th, 1938. Wow. Here's their patents. Tell us a bit more about the patents, if you can. Well, there was the original bulb, bulb rubber patent here, where the, uh, the attachment method to hold the rubber in is an opening on a larger opening on the end and a small gap, and so this it, it in effect holds the bulb of the rubber in, and uh, uh, this was uh, basically a revolution because before that all the rubber was held in with little screws that sandwiched the rubber together on the end of the squeegee. The guy. Got me for keeping the toy out of there. More than enough. <laughs> More than enough. <laughs> so, welcome to where all the magic happens, and uh, Diane's going to take us over to where they inspect all the rubber and show us the process for that and then where it gets packaged. It's pretty neat. The rubber's molded into batches and they uh, put it into. Uh, bins for sorting by size. The original extrusion comes out on that little tight side of the table there and then they'll measure 
and touch each one, cut it to length and put it on the table. Rubber is molded on a bulb on each side. Then it's uh, laid onto this cutting table and lubricated with an emulsion that allows it to slide through the cutting blades. This is uh, the cutting system. Been uh, pretty much the same cutting since uh, uh, 80 years ago, uh, developed by uh, Diane's father. And uh, they slide through and end up cut as two pieces. The bundles are then uh, rolled over to the next area where the uh, um, are sized to the correct size and inspected by human hands. So it's a silicone emulsion that lubricates the rubber so that it can go through the, the cutting board. area rubber for 80 years has been cut on that wheel system right there. So we we grab a heap out of that bin that he just cut in that instance and they put it here on the on the cutting table and then she'll work to a specific length. She's got a stopper that gives her her size here. So she's doing 18s. All right. Runs her finger along, lays it in the trough to get the 18 inch, and then this little weighted cutter cuts it to the correct size. The technology of rubber has changed a lot in the last 10 years. When you have little inclusions in here in the rubber and the, the blade slices through, it exposes that on the edge. And in the last 10 years, Dan is saying that the rubber quality that they're getting in, uh, for the rubber to turn into the mold is so much better now that um, they, the job here of inspecting and cutting pieces is a lot easier. Where before they would find a, an inclusion in the edge and if there was enough left over they might get an 8 inch rubber. Well that seldom happens now with the improvements to the rubber manufacturing process that Ed Array has worked on with their manufacturers. What had happened a few years back, we even have to pay attention to the, the type of gloves that the people, the workers are using because when they were, whatever process that they have to touch it by hand, when they were touching it and putting it into the mold, the uh, excess was coming off the gloves going into there and then producing rubber that had all this fiber in it. And we couldn't figure out what was going on until we actually went and found out it was the gloves they were using. So even that makes a difference. So the fiber would be embedded into the rubber and then the blade would come along and slit it and you'd have these little furry ends on the end like a brush and you're like, where's this coming from? <laughs> Here's a stack of 14s on a work table ready for packaging. The packaging is done uh, over here at this work center, again touched by human hands where they line all the rubber up, make sure it's the right size and then slip it into its packing uh, method. Um, they're using uh, tubes now um, to package, which is nice for the end user because they can take it out of the tube and it protects the rubber in the field. Where before it was uh, only packaged on a uh, cardboard board with a, with a saran wrap over it. And uh, so little improvements all along have uh, always kept that array ahead of the rest of the field. So always listening is uh, kind of a motto at Ettore. They want to understand how their products are used and this packaging came from that listening to the field. Um, and the, uh, this kind of a package is, is really well received by the window cleaner and paper users because the rubber they're not using is protected. They can throw it in their bucket and uh, or before they might have 10 or 11 leftover rubbers from opening the original package kind of sitting somewhere. They have to figure out how to protect it themselves. The, this new this packaging they've developed over the last couple of years has been uh, well received. So the next time the rubber is touched is when uh, you buy a channel that has a rubber inside. So they won't package that rubber like this because that's meant for replacements. In this, this instance, they take the rubber right off the workstation and uh, lay it next to the channel assembly area and then these gentlemen are taking the rubber, sliding it in and putting in the end clips that you get. Um, we're doing some uh, brass fabrication right now over here.
so, so Diane, I noticed that each of these workstations has a vice in it. What do yep. they use the vice for? They use it usually if if um, the channels have to go into a cleaning process into a, uh, a machine, which I'll show you later. Sometimes they get a little out of shape, mm -hmm. so they have to be straight when they go out. So the vice is used just that the guy putting the rubber in the channel uses it to give it a little oomph. If it needs to be straightened or not, it's not as bad as it used to be, but at one one time it was difficult because we used to use a different process. So that's what that's for. And it's pretty much been like that since day one, too. Mm -hmm. Then down here you'll see we have uh, the different kinds of channels waiting for their rubber. So brass, aluminum, stainless steel, all waiting in bins for uh, loading up. These are the beads they use to tumble polish. We'll see the tumble polisher in a minute. So there's a whole bucket full of these little beads that are used to, to put that shine on the product when it comes out of the machine. Ah, the stamping machine for the handles. Or... Uh, we used to do all this in house, right. but it got really hard because of the Silicon Valley to keep an engineer in house because mm -hmm. they wanted exorbitant money. So all our, our presses and dyes went like, 20 miles down the road to a city, city named Hayward, where they're all stamped for us. They're, it's done, we had, to, we had to move it, because we did, but it's still all under our supervision and everything. But that's Punched out in a flat, and then stuck into a machine that curves it and stamps the yeah, final like uh, machine. Used to be a, used to be a six, step process once upon a time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, because the first one cut, that, that cuts this thing flat, because you have to understand I've been here since I was 12. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Just a couple years ago. Uh, yeah, a very short time ago. So it, it's on a big spool like those, but wider, so it cuts flat. Then there's one that bends it one way, and then there's one that punches the holes. And so I think it's about a six, it's a six die process, I think. If it's still so you have aluminum handles, this is uh, relatively new, a couple of years now for aluminum. And then your traditional brass, people like the weight of the brass in their hands. Um, and then the uh, stainless steel behind you here. Um, in the channels, in the channels, people like the aluminum for its light weight and in the ease of fanning, okay? A brass is more doable than the either two. So a brass, if it gets, you can dog ear it easier, you can straighten it back out if it gets bent when it gets caught in your bucket. And then stainless steel, um, it just has a nice feel for a lot of guys, and most of the guys use whatever they were taught with. So if they were taught with stainless steel, they stick with stainless steel. Um, a few will venture off and try other things, but by far and away, brass is probably the 60-70% of what most guys use. So the, 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 brass, the brass for the channel or the aluminum or the stainless steel comes in on these wheels. So you can see the, uh, it comes in flat load it on this machine. Yeah, we have to have one for stainless and one for brass. Because Different die quality well, in here. Well, yeah, the stainless is much harder. Mm -hmm. So it was just tearing up the, the other machine. The original so machine, yeah. So this, this machine is dedicated to stainless steel because the stainless steel is a harder material. This machine had to be bulked up to perform the process of bending and folding it over. Where here's one of the original machines. Now Mike developed this machine, isn't it? Didn't he? With the company in Chicago, yeah. The, the All right, so Mike Schmalek, uh, Diane's, Diane's husband, was the lead engineer at Ettery working with another team to develop and build this machine to be able to roll their own channels. So now it's been it's been been cleaned up a little bit. Goes into all of these little wheels on top. And it's formed. It's called a roll former. There we go. A roll former. So the metal comes in flat, and then one die at a time, it slowly puts the the groove in here, and a little deeper, and a little deeper. A little deeper and a little narrower and a little narrower until finally it comes down to the thinnest portion for holding it and the last size of the die comes out of the machine and comes over here to be cut off to the appropriate length. 
So it's slowly taking it one die at a time and rolling it up with the bulb on the bottom until it comes out perfect at the other end and it goes through a die gauge to make sure everything lines up and then gets chopped off at the end and goes into the hopper. So when they come out, they don't look very shiny. All right, they've been gone through this molding process and now they're sitting here and it's not with the consumer shine that you're used to. So in order to really make them, uh, make them shine and look great when you get them um, uh, in your doorstep, um, they put them in this uh, bead polisher. Um, this machine also embosses the Ettore logo on the side at the same time, so it has a little embossing wheel. Fortunately, they're not on right now, so we don't have to have our earmuffs on because these things are noisy as heck. Yeah, I think it's you're burning, right. Yeah, it's, burning, it's a burnishing machine. So we saw the little beads. We saw the little beads in my hand, and this is just chock a block full of those beads. And they dump the product in, and it makes a revolution around inside of here, and then works its way up to come out and get dropped into the, into the tank. So you could imagine, with the thousands and thousands of these handles that they have, Okay, that used to be hand dipped by uh, Diane in a summertime project. Okay, they all need two little screws, nuts, and a backing plate. And what it would take for two for a person to sit there every day, all day, and stick screws and nuts together to get these things done. So they developed a machine. And uh, what you have here is you can see the nuts coming up on the top, loading in and the screws. So the time it would take me to get one nut on a screw and start to tighten, she's got two full squeegees done. <laughs> So another one of Diane's jobs, okay, <laughs> back in the day was to actually do this by hand, okay? And uh, so she would, well, you, had you, to she, hold it this way. you had to hold it this way and she would. And you had to have your little screws and hold it together. And then the, I didn't even have the electric, I mean, not the electric, but, but the, the screwdriver right. ones. So you had to put them in there and then you had to tighten the little screws. And then you, You'd you know, put your fingers on it, right? turn it and over you, yep. and screw it in. Yeah. <laughs> And then you'd have a channel. And she was paid 10, 10 cents, cents a box. box. And what did you do? I said I wouldn't do it anymore unless I got a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> so there's other things they do here too. I was noticing that right now they're packaging belts up into the, the kind of packaging that are sent on to the distribution center and uh, putting it through a shrink rack machine and then packaging them up into their trademark kind of white boxes with their part number on the end. So the in, all the individual. Um, all the individual holsters or, or belts, all the individual belts come in in, in loose in boxes, then they need to be packaged for the, the distribution. So here they count them up, stick them in, wrap them in plastic, and then they'll stick them through the oven to shrink wrap the plastic around the product. As a kid. How are you doing? Wayne Schultz, uh, sales uh, vice president for uh, Ettore products here in Alameda. So Ettore has all the fun toys. You'll notice that uh, pallets are, are wrapped with a plastic to keep them together um, and uh, for shipment in that instance. And over here, they have this cool machine where they roll the pallet onto this platform and then they grab, they grab a tail of the shrink wrap and then the machine the machine rolls around in a circle <laughs> wrap me up <laughs> turns the pallet around in a circle and off they go and that keeps a lot less dizzy employees from having to wander around the pallet this is the customer wrapping all the different individual boxes are now going to be wrapped up, unlike the warehouse wrapping where it was all the same thing on a box in a pallet. Now this is a customer's various products being wrapped up to be given to the freight company.
So Ederway has grown from the concept of a bulb rubber in a, in a channel to over 300 products that represents thousands of div different items because of the different sizes, base metals that you can get it in. And all of it ends up at some point when it comes to you going through this little section here. So now you'll see all sorts of different size boxes, shapes, sizes being aggregated to go out to their distributors around the world. And uh, so there'll be some poles, some sleeves, some channels, some Webster's, some, all these different things will be put together and um, sent off and loaded up on that UPS truck that we saw outside when we cruised in or freight to other places. And uh, this is the, the final aggregate place that uh, the last time they see it before uh, it goes off to the consumer. We'll just catch up with thing. you in customer service. Just one thing, Steve. He's not, mm -hmm. he's not mic'd up. Okay. So probably we have to stay close. Okay. Yeah. Hey, honey. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be on bloopers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where do you want to go first? Okay. So um, it's kind of R and D and engineering. Wow. Um, just to kind of show you, they're not here, so there's not a lot going on. But at least you can see where, where you it are. is. <laughs> yeah. Just catch little things you see. Catch their eye. <laughs> he can't tell you too much about all the secrets going on sure. here, but this is what's uh, this is kind the of magic happening. This is kind of our, our engineering and um, you know prototyping um, kind of area. It doesn't necessarily start here. This is a prototyping machine. Um, I'm trying to show you. Like a 3D machine. Yeah, 3D printer is yeah. basically what it is. So cool. it starts here and we actually do prototyping and that sort of thing. And then from there, we know what we need to adjust and tweak and then um, takes it to the to the molding process and, and all of that. This side over here is kind of our engineering operations think tank. <laughs> um, they're all on vacation today, so you can't see any of them. But <laughs> it's... Did they know I was coming? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is probably more retail oriented, but not, not completely. So we try to put everything out so we can determine, you know, what, what is appropriate for the, the project that we're trying to sell or the, or the planogram that we're trying to work with. Currently we're repackaging some of our duster products. And so that's kind of taken over. We have display things that are kind of stuffed in the corner at the moment, but this is kind of where we build our displays and determine what we're going to do. And this is yeah, a work the, in progress. This doesn't stay like any, you've probably seen it in 80 different configurations. Yeah. The thing to think about in this instance is when you see Ettore products in the store, um, at a Jansan house, they may use a pre-configured cleaning center display. But uh, the larger the place gets, the more they want to take over the planning and the planograms that he describes. So they need to make sure that their products are going to fit into the little sizes that the customer needs in that instance. And this is the tweaking that they're describing that says, we'd like to have one package for everything we sell, but the customer demand is such that sometimes they end up making things a little different. And here in this room is where they put it all together physically to make sure that it's going to meet that need in the field for retail or distribution display. Good to see, see you again. What are, uh, what are we doing here? You're on camera. Oh, this I, is I Lee, that. Lee oh, from Window about. Cleaning Magazine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Customer service. This, this is um, Nicole, Adderay's granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And obviously you've met Diane, but this is customer service. This is where the magic happens. Yes. And this is where all the work goes Easter? down. Yeah. 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 So now into decorating. <laughs> seasonal. So one of, one of the nice it's things seasonal. about a family business is that uh, often people are talking to the family and they aren't even aware they're doing it. <laughs> So you call in and you talk to customer service and uh, it may be Diane's turn on the wheel and she's one that takes the phone call and starts talking to it. She has a, a funny little story about that, about uh, sometimes it's not always an easy problem to solve and they're on the phone with her and they ask, can I talk to someone higher up than you? And her answer is at that point, uh, you can't get any higher. <laughs> 
a small silence on the other end of the phone while I digest that <laughs> sometimes. So, um, but She's good at her job, though. Uh, Sassy, but good. Yeah. She, when you start out on the floor yeah, assembling yeah, exactly. squeegees, you have a little knowledge of how they work, right? Yeah, exactly. That's Tony. Tony's been with us for like 11 years or more. Maybe 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and this is awesome. Monica. Monica's been with us almost a year, maybe? Okay. So I'll be I'm here. The baby. So in here, they're pasting up, getting ready for the new catalog. And uh, so you, have a, you can see through the window here a little catalog layout going on. So this actually might be interesting. Um, so initially, this is kind of how that starts. So you start kind of with some brainstorming ideas. Um, in this particular case, it never really went anywhere. But um, so then, you know, we go through. And if you notice, we have some kind of voting, you know, things on here, what, what we want to do. Mm. Then once we decide the two or three formats that we want to do, no matter what the project is, then that goes to engineering where they actually design it and, mm. and get it out into real dimensions. Then we print that out in our 3D printer work it and make sure all that works and then from there it goes into production so this is kind of that process they actually will uh, get window cleaners involved uh, like they do with the contour and they'll ask them how it feels in their hand and how's the spring tension and does the latch work right for them and all that kind of stuff before they go off and yeah. break into real molds mm -hmm.